go for it, Tim. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see everyone here this morning for our time of worship and teaching together. Um, it's lovely I can welcome... There he is. There. <laughs> Worry when you start to see this. Um, anyway, it's lovely to welcome John Waldron, who is one of the leaders at uh, Shirley Baptist Church, because uh, we know Sean uh, very well, I think, Shirley. And uh, it's, anyway, it's lovely that John is with us to speak to us later on in the service. Uh, hopefully, you've all picked up your weekly news sheet. A lot's going on. Can I just officially announce the church members' meeting? Um, which is in February. Uh, I've lost where it is now. It's not on there, it's on the, that's right, it's not on this one, it's on the email we sent out. And it's on the Wednesday, the 7th. I think it's the same Sorry? It's coming soon. Coming soon, it's the first Wednesday. First Wednesday. Anyway, to make sure you've had a look through the weekly news, and, uh, it is the 7th, yeah, okay. There's lots of things going on uh, in the life of the fellowship, you know, uh, well, I think the Connect group is restarting after the Christmas break, so if you're free on a Tuesday morning, pop in. Um, on a Tuesday. <laughs> Um, Tops on Wednesday, and then of course the Thursday home group meeting at the church on Thursday, after, Thursday afternoon, and the Beans Club on Friday. Can I just thank everyone participating in helping with Beans Club, um, and particularly if you're helping with the catering week by week. It, it is lovely to see uh, the families together there. Just keep praying for that as we meet together. There's still some vacancies if you can help with the catering. And there's some other notices you want to read about some opportunities. So next Sunday we meet back here in the school. And Ian Thompson from Bringing Good News will be speaking on that occasion. And can I particularly mention this evening we have communion and we're meeting at the church building at 6.30. We focus particularly on the communion. We spend that time thinking about the Lord Jesus in that way, in a particular way, which we can you know, use that time to really focus on his death this evening at 6.30, which is going to be led by David. So we thank him for that. Last week, um, Alan opened up a number of verses which I've been thinking about during the week, and I want to share a couple of those this morning and just to focus our thoughts as we come to worship. There were lovely thoughts talking about kind of preparing for a new year and kind of letting, pressing on to what God wants us to have. And some words from Psalm 122. I wonder if this is how you feel this morning. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city where people come together. That is where the different families go, the families of the Lord. There they give thanks to the name of the Lord. And I just pray this morning that that will be our sense as we come, that there's a desire to want to worship God. It's lovely, this idea. It's a place where people come together. That, when they were talking about Jerusalem, of course, for those people in those days, it was very much where the temple was. It's where the worship, the kind of official worship happened, and where God dwelt in the temple. And where people would come from all across the country to worship in Jerusalem. Um, but of course, God is not limited by building. We can, of course, worship God at home on our own. But there's something special when we worship God together as we encourage each other. So let's 
just at the start of meeting in prayer. Our loving Father, we thank you that we can come together this morning. Lord, we thank you that you love us as individuals, but Lord, also you love us as your people, as your church here this morning. Father, we pray that you will just take our worship. You will help us to worship you. Father, we pray that you will just put that real desire in our hearts this morning to be able to just worship you from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, take away any distractions that we may have. Lord, things that have been burdening us and concerning us during the week. Lord, we pray that as we come into your presence, Lord, that we will sense you there with alongside us and helping to carry those burdens for us. So, Lord, we pray that our worship will be honouring to you this morning because we come together in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Having just been saying about how important it is to sing and worship together, when we started looking through our songs that we regularly sing, it was very it was strange that how many hymns and songs have the word I and not we. And as we sing our first song, I really wanted it to be a song that started with we. But the one I wanted to start with starts with I, as you can see. Whether we can sing it as we and then, I don't know. But uh, let's, let's, as we come together this one, let's first of all perhaps just acknowledge that we are coming as individuals. We just have to, we can't come through anybody else's faith. We have to come in our own faith this morning. So let's come and worship as we sing this song. And then we'll move on for another song
us. So we come together.
Sorry. Perhaps I should have put one under everybody's chair or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was some words in Ezekiel that Alan shared with us. And it was thinking about the time where God was talking to his people about the time they would return to authenticity. And it was, it was at the time when the people were going to return to <coughs> Jerusalem. And this is what God said to his people through his, his Ezekiel. When they return to it, they will take away all the hated and sinful things. I will give them one heart, and I will put a spirit within them. I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh. <coughs> then they will walk in my laws, and keep them, and obey them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. So you still might be wondering, why am I giving you yes. a my I, I couldn't really, if I'd given everybody a bump of liver or something, that would have been a bit disgusting and a bit weird. So I, I was thinking, what can I think about that's soft and malleable? And that's what God was talking about. He, had, he was worried that his people were like a stone. They were, they were very hard. And although, I mean, on this stone, it's actually a very shiny stone. <laughs> on the outside, they made us look quite respectable. But deep down, they were cold. And they were hard. And they were unchanging. Um, I don't know if you've ever done st wood or stone carving, anybody. But it's not easy. You need a sharp chisel. It takes a lot of working with stone. And of course, there's always that risk with stone that it, when you, you know, when you kind of hit it, it breaks. If you've ever done kind of a concrete patio or anything, you know that if you hit the stone in the wrong place and it cracks because it follows a vein and it becomes hard and it's, it's difficult to work with and it takes hard work to make it what you want it to do. But with a marshmallow, it's soft and the flesh, our flesh, is he wants us to be real people who care. And I've been thinking about this, I think God's been talking to me about this during the week, that sometimes I can be quite hard. And I need to be like a marshmallow. And even, you can even be like a tea cake this morning. Um, I don't know, these tea cakes, I don't you know what's inside them. Like marshmallow, a bit of strawberry jam, surrounded by chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> and a bit of cream made And they've got a bit of biscuit at the bottom. But although these aren't as, I mean, obviously the chocolate is not as hard as a stone, that kind of outer layer sometimes is a bit, can be on these, I got these kind of. They're not the traps, they're real ones. If you're not, they're not, <laughs> the chocolate isn't as thick. But, um, you know, if you get a proper tea cake when it's got a lot of chocolate on it, the outer layer is quite difficult to bite through. It's quite hard. And I was just thinking, in the way I do these, it's kind of thing, it's running like crazy. You know, sometimes we can start to get a hard layer on the outside where God wants us to be soft and caring. And I was thinking particularly, you know, over the last, I suppose, it, it, you know, however long you've lived, you see things on television, you hear about <coughs> things that are happening even in our community. We heard of a boy recently who was held up by a knife point in Southampton. Um, and, you know, you see what's happening in Ukraine, you see what's happening in Gaza, what's happened in Israel, what's happening in various seats, you know, shipping lanes. 
And to a certain extent, you can be start to become a little bit hard. Hopefully, we don't become as hard as a stone. But there is a danger. We start to get a bit of a, a crust. And that's not how God wants us to be. Now, I don't know whether a marshmallow feels pain when you eat it. It's probably not. It's not, it's not a person. But if you take the illustration a bit further, you know, God wants us, in a sense, to be able to feel that pain, not to be overwhelmed by it, because we know that God is with us in every circumstance. And so God wants us to be able to melt away those hard hearts, the, the outer crust. He wants to take away the sadness and the hurt. Maybe sometimes we get overcome by suffering and bitterness and our, our outer shell becomes a bit thicker and a bit more difficult to break through. He doesn't want us to be suffering from compassion fatigue or maybe just plain selfishness. So just think about that and then at a convenient point in the service you can eat a marshmallow. But just think about those things. I will take away the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. And as we think about this, we can't do it without God's Holy Spirit coming through our lives. So let's sing, O oh, breath of life, come sweeping through us. Revive thy church with power, light and power. And then that's basically the second verse of the old spell. Then in thy tenderness, remake us.
where we recognise that sometimes we do get compassion fatigue, Lord, we see so much that hurts. Lord, maybe we have things in our own lives that cause us to put a kind of a protection around ourselves. Lord, because we don't want to be hurt, or because we're sad, or because we're bitter. Lord, we just pray with your Holy Spirit working in our lives this morning, Lord, that you will just take away those things that are stopping you from, stopping us to be the people who you want us to be. Lord, just help us as we pray. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being able to pray for ourselves, for our community, for our families, and for our world this morning. Lord, we pray that we will pray with your compassion in these situations, because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, while we've been meditating on the softening of our own hearts, we are conscious that we live in a world where there are many hard hearts, many hearts that are evil, many hearts that are, are callous. And we see that in this suffering of the world. Even our foreign secretary this morning uh, so talked about flashing red lights of danger around the globe. And Lord, we know that these are explosive situations. But beyond it all, there are people, there are individuals who will suffer alone, perhaps, or in community. And so we're just asking our heavenly Father that there will not only be a softening of our own attitudes to the things of this world, but may there be a softening of attitudes and hearts around the world so that there may come a time of peace and tranquility on this world which has been so delighted by the activities of the evil one. <coughs> we ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Lord, as Taiwan elects a new leader, we pray for Xi Jinping in China. Lord, that he stay his hand. Should he decide this year to take back Taiwan, that would get very messy very, very quickly, Lord, and make other conflicts seem as nothing. Should China take on America and, and yet another proxy war. And Lord, in the same voice, we pray for the Houthis, 
and the Iranians that are backing them, Lord, again, that they would uh, back off and allow free trade down that narrow piece of water, Lord. And above all, I pray that we aren't dragged into a war in that place. So many forces of evil at work as Tim has played, Lord. We just pray, Father God, leaving it in your hands, but asking that you have mercy upon us. Amen. Amen. <coughs> So we pray that you'll soften our hearts as we are <coughs> involved in local situations as well, and people who we know, people in our community who we know are struggling and suffering. Lord, give us that heart that comes from you. Lord, help us not to be overwhelmed, but to rely on you. <coughs> or to show, to do the things that you would do. Lord, to be your hands and your feet and your care in those situations. So Father, we just pray for our community and for those in need in our community this morning. Lord, we pray for each other. Lord, we particularly pray for those in our congregation, Lord, who are still struggling with this kind of cold, fluey thing that's been going around, Lord. Lord, we particularly would pray for Colin this morning, Lord, just continue in his healing. Father, we pray uh, for Robert, Lord, and Lord, as he's had treatment, Lord, we just lift him up to you this morning, and Lord, we pray for Teresa as she supports him, Lord, just be in that family, we pray, and Lord, we would also lift up Sophie to you this morning, we thank you that Sophie's with us this morning, and Lord, we just, just pray your, your blessing on her and Leah, with the baby coming, or just give all the safety and the care that's needed in that situation, Lord, so they can have the joy of welcoming their new baby. Lord, we just commit these things to you because we know that you care about them and you care about us. So, Father, we just lift our prayers to you in the name of Jesus. And let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For kingdom, the power, and the glory of our now and forever. Amen. Amen. We're now going to have the Bible reading. Joy's going to bring that. Thank you. Our reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 4. On the Church Bibles, it's page 967. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. 
Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, Worship the Lord your God, and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Okay. So in a minute, John's going to come up and speak. And before we do that, we're going to sing one final song, which I think is a lovely song written by, or amended by John, by Graham Kendrick. It's an older song that's been kind of renewed. The, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. Let's just kind of bathe in his love this morning.
dwell in him this morning and with us as we open up your word, Lord. Pray that John will feel free to speak what you've put on his heart this morning. Lord, just bless him and bless us through him, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
Is there any way to become ready and anchored in preparation for what's to come in 2024? I walked in on my 33-year-old son over Christmas watching the movie The Incredibles. Not that I sat and watched it too, but there was one line in that film that I believe is key to going into this new year. Some advice was passed from Mrs. Incredible to her daughter. She said this, protect your identity. It's the most important thing you have. Protect your identity. It's the most important thing you have. And as we go into this new year, getting ready for the mixed bag that life will throw at us, I'd say the same thing is most important for us. Our identity. Our identity is how we mark who we are. For some of us, our identity is clear. For others of us, I guess it's a bit muddy. Many of us spend much of our lives finding ourselves. Well, what have you come up with? Who are you? And as we look into the future, who we are, our identity, will be either our anchor or our weakness this year and in the years to come. What's our identity? Marketing companies would love our identity to be very shallow, just in reading. <clears throat> that we are what we eat, or what we wear, or the music that we listen to. Our employers might like it best if we're defined by the job that we hold. What we do, that we're accountants, or teachers, or pharmacists, or stay-at-home mums and dads. Our friends might like it if we only think of ourselves as retired. Or our teachers might like it if we think of ourselves as piano players, or painters, or simply students. But we can't put the cart before the horse, can we? We can't let what we do define who we are. If you're more than just what you do, then who are you? If you're more than the accumulation of the titles that you carry, who are you? And if that is a tough question to answer, then we're probably not ready for life's mixed bag of joy and tragedy in 2024. What is your identity? Now, I know one way to find out. I know of an identity test, and it's pretty extreme. And I think the best way to know who we really are is to strip everything from us. Our jobs, our families, our schools, our plans, our savings, our transportation, our shelter, our food. Strip it all away and have a look at who we are. Because that would say a lot about us. To strip it all away and have a look gives us an accurate look at who we are. But it's not a complete look. We need to go to the other extreme as well, to round off the test, to be offered dream jobs, the family we've longed for, the money we need to do and have, all those things that we've wanted, to have power and authority and prestige if we load ourselves with all of these things and have a look at who we were, we'd again learn something of our identity. And the big question is, if we participated in both of those scenarios, if we had it all stripped away, and if we had it all at our fingertips, would our identity look the same in each scenario? And if the answer is yes, then we're likely in good shape. If the answer is no, we can expect to be tossed around by life's waves that we've just been singing about in the last song. Now I know of one person who took this identity test and we had it in our reading this morning. The Lord Jesus went through this and his experience is recorded as we've seen in Matthew chapter 4. And the story could only have come from Jesus' lips. When I was looking at this this week, I suddenly realised that nobody witnessed this, so Jesus must have spoken about it. He must have chosen to share a page out of his 
private journal. So it could be passed on to us. Tom Wright, the Bible commentator, says, we have to approach this story with a unique and special reverence, for in it, Jesus is laying bare his inmost heart and soul. He's telling us what he went through. It is the most sacred story, for in it, he draws the veil from his own struggle to help us in our struggle. And even though a nice mixed bag usually hits us externally, the experience Jesus has here reminds us of the location of most of life's struggles. In, if someone had gone out into the desert to see him, they'd have seen Jesus alone, but in anguish. He was in a battle in his mind. And our minds are a battlefield. And if we don't have a strong anchor in there, we're in trouble. And our identity has to be our anchor. And one of the fir first things we realised about Jesus was that he let the identity test happen at all. It says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We know that what follows wasn't very pretty. And yes, we should acknowledge at this point that God will lead us into wilderness experiences to test us. God will allow that to happen. And thinking about that sometimes makes me quite cross with God, that he would take us into a desert experience to test us. It makes me frustrated. But when I look at the big picture, I know and trust that he has our best interests at heart. And let me see what happens when God tests us, because these tests are always painfully stretching for us. And because they leave us, tired and vulnerable. And because we're like that, that's when the devil will attack us. And he capitalises and takes advantage of our weakened state. God tests and lets, us be t and lets us be tempted, but he doesn't do the tempting. The enemy is the one who takes our test and makes it a temptation. And we can count on the enemy complicating things when we're being tested. And the test itself has Jesus in the wilderness, stripped of everything. He was without companionship. He was without position. He was without shelter. He had no food, everything. And it was while he was in this state that the devil comes to him and does three things to shake his identity. See if any of these things are familiar to you in your life. First of all, Satan tempts us to have something we're not meant to have. Look at verses 3 to 4. Matthew says, The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. Satan tempted Jesus with the most basic and immediate need, food. Now, is there anything wrong with food, with eating bread or marshmallows, for Tim's sake, when we're hungry? Of course not. But it's just not what God had in mind for Jesus at that particular moment. Jesus was fasting. He was abstaining from food so that he could focus totally on his Father, on God. It was not time for him to eat bread. And you know, Satan will tempt us along those same lines to have things we're not meant to have. Or to have them when we're not meant to have them. Sometimes he tempts us with food, too much food, the wrong kind of food. It reminds me of a story of an overweight businessman who decided it was time he shed some excess pounds. So he took his new diet very seriously, <coughs> even changing his driving route to work to avoid his favourite bakery on the way. One morning, however, he showed up at work with an enormous coffee cake. And all of his work colleagues scolded him, but his smile remained nonetheless. This is a special coffee cake, he explained. I accidentally drove by the bakery this morning 
And there in the window was a host of goodies, and I felt it was no accident, so I prayed, Lord, if you want me to have one of those delicious coffee cakes, let there be a parking spot right outside the shop. And sure enough, <coughs> the eighth time round the block, <laughs> there was. And the devil can tempt us to have just about anything. Nicer clothes, a newer car, smarter technology. Now, there might not be anything wrong with any of these things, but they, may, they might lead us on a detour from God's path. We might have to compromise our integrity to get some of those things. We might have to work too many hours to hang on to some of those things. We might have to give less to God and to others so that we can have more to spend on ourselves. And even if we can't have those things, the mere desire for them can sometimes rob us of the joy of living in God's way and in His plan. It can stir up jealousy inside of us. It can stir up greed in our hearts. It can give us a hard heart. And the devil turned Jesus' attention to what he didn't have. But you know, this didn't shape Jesus because Someone whose identity is anchored doesn't dwell or get shaken by negative circumstances. They don't focus on what they don't have, and Jesus didn't. Then comes the second temptation. The devil tries to come between Jesus and God the Father. <clears throat> Verse 5 of chapter 4. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it's written he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So this time, Satan throws scripture at Jesus, twisting its meaning. And it's an old tactic of the devil, isn't it? He used it on Eve back in the Garden of Eden. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? <coughs> God did say he would protect his children. But he didn't say he would protect them from every single thing, especially from every reckless and presumptuous act that tests God's provision. Satan will tempt us to do something we're not meant to do. To go off on our own. To follow our own heart. To take a selfish view about things. To live carelessly or recklessly, presuming that God will catch us when we fall. That's a dangerous assumption to make. We were not meant to abuse our minds and bodies with drugs and alcohol. Men and women were not meant to give themselves away sexually, outside the safety of marriage. We weren't meant to let our anger explode. When we do those things, it ends badly. We hurt ourselves, and we hurt other people. Are you tempted to do something you weren't meant to do? The devil tries to come between Jesus and God the Father, he tried to undermine Jesus' faith, distorting the character and reputation of God. And that's why Jesus' first petition to God, we read it together at the end of our prayer time in the Lord's Prayer, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. It means, Father, reveal and protect your character for all of us to see. Hallow your name. Don't let your reputation be muddied, Father. Don't let our foundation be taken away. The devil tried to muddy God's reputation. But this didn't shake Jesus either. Because someone whose identity is anchored doesn't buy into the lie that God is not good. And Jesus did. And then finally, the devil tried to get Jesus focusing on the easy way out. He tried to sell Jesus the wonderful idea that life doesn't have to be so difficult. 
There is an easy street. And Jesus knew that serving his father was going to be a long, long journey uphill. His face was going to be turned like flint towards Jerusalem and the cross. Life was going to be painful. It was not going to be easy. So the devil offered him an easier way. Worship me, he said. Verse 9, and I'll give you everything. The whole world can be at your fingertips. It's your choice. But Jesus knew he was to be a king by serving. <coughs> His crown would come through the cross. And Satan invited Jesus to become an earthly king, to have all the cities and the nations of the world bow down before him. And to be clear, Satan did not have the ability to offer Jesus the kingdoms of the world. But lying has never been a problem for Satan. The problem, of course, is that this is not the kind of king that Jesus came to be. The Father didn't send him to set up an earthly kingdom. He sent him to establish a heavenly kingdom. And you know, Satan will come to us in the same way. He'll tempt us to be something we're not meant to be. To be popular, to be powerful, to be successful, to go with the flow of the world, to be comfortable. Now, God's story may include some of those things along the way. But Satan comes along and tells us, get them now. Fill your boots now, before God's perfect timing. And so we run ahead of God, or we work around God, or we walk away from God. Are you tempted to be something you're not meant to be? <clears throat> but this didn't shape Jesus either, because the person whose identity is anchored doesn't need to forgo the right for the easy way. So Jesus was tempted on these three lines to have something, to be somebody, and to do something other than God intended. In other words, Jesus was being tempted to break away from God's story. And Satan offered Jesus a different storyline without hardship, without suffering, without the cross. That's the same thing he offered Adam and Eve, a different storyline. It's the same thing he offered Israel in the desert, in the book of Exodus, different storyline. It's the same thing he offers you and me every time he suggests we be or do or have something contrary to God's intent. And Adam and Eve fell victim to that temptation and the people of Israel fell victim to that temptation time and time again. You and I fall victim to that temptation all the time. But Jesus didn't fail. Jesus stood the test. He looked Satan in the eye and he said, My life is about more than food. It's about more than power. It's about more than safety. It's about doing my Father's will and fulfilling his purpose. And after thousands of years of humiliation at the hands of a bully named Satan, Jesus arrives on earth to rewrite history. And Jesus came to face the bully. He came to show us how to live God's story in our lives. And the Old Testament tells us that human beings, well, they can't live God's story by themselves. Jesus had to come to show us how to do it. And Jesus faced the bully three, three times. He came at him with his worst stuff. And three times, Jesus fended him off. Now, how did he do that? How did he manage it? Well, can I draw you to the event in the chapter before? If you look at the end of the chapter before, chapter 3, we read that um, Jesus was baptised. And at the end of the baptism, God pulls back the curtain that separates earth from the heavens, and he affirms Jesus in his identity. He says this, This is my priceless son. I'm deeply pleased with him. That's the place to have our identity. The child of God the Father. Creator and sustainer of life itself. 
Jesus was a child of the Most High God. Is there a better way to identify yourself? I mean, it's safe under his arm. Who else's opinion matters when you're there in his arms? It's inspiring at his feet. Is there a better place to learn than at the feet of our Creator? It's joy in his embrace. He knows our lives inside out. He knows us completely. What affirmation counts like the affirmation that comes from God? His ways fit like a glove. Every other way is wandering blindly. And Jesus is affirmed at the age of 30 at his baptism as the Father's Son. But you know, this wasn't you. If you look in the book of Luke, where it describes Jesus as a 12-year-old boy, his parents were worried sick because three days they couldn't find him on the way to the temple and being at the temple. They looked everywhere for him, finally finding him at the temple. And he was shocked. They didn't know where he was. And he said to them, why didn't you expect me to be with my father? I had to be with him. You see, the secret Jesus knew was that he was his heavenly father's son. Nothing more, nothing less. And that being a child of God meant sitting at his father's feet, learning about him, and from him all his life would flow. He was well anchored in his identity by the time this test in the desert came along. And as he planned, he was even better anchored on the other side of this test. He knew that even in the worst of circumstances, having a father with him is more than enough. He knew that even though his father led him through some very dark valleys, that those struggles would be redeemed with enormous value. And here's the good news for us. God the Father invites us to be adopted as his children, just as Jesus is his child. And as we follow the lead of Jesus, sitting at the Father's feet, we'll please the Father as well. Jesus wasn't a child of the Almighty God because he did all the right things. The Father loves everyone who walks this planet. Everyone that he has created. The whole Bible attests to that. It isn't because Jesus did everything right. Jesus is the child of the Father because he trusts the Father and sits at the Father's feet, and being leads to doing. Being at his Father's feet led him to doing his Father's will. And it's clear Jesus had been at his Father's feet for all his life. And in each of his responses to the devil, Jesus responds with scripture. The Bible calls scripture, God breathed. He soaked in God the Father's words and used them to fight off the enemy in the desert. He'd sat in the word of God. It was a light to his feet. It was his defense, his attack, his bread, his breath. He knew it in his bones. He knew truth from lies. He knew right from wrong. Jesus had been making himself available to the Father all his life. And we see that in the fact that he knew scripture so well. He'd been fasting for 40 days. He'd been sitting at his father's feet. And while Jesus was out in the desert, he was stripped of everything. He was without companionship or position or shelter or food, everything. And then he was offered everything by Satan. He was offered position and provision and health and power, everything. And neither poverty nor prosperity changed things. Without a thing, he was his father's son. With everything at his fingertips, he was his father's son. And the question we need to be asking ourselves as we progress into this new year is who are we at the core? Because who we are at the core will determine who we are when the world comes crashing down on us or when the best of the world is offered to us on a plate. Both in us to destroy us if our core isn't made of the right stuff. So friends, are you ready for life's mixed bag in 2024? 
Here's a worthy resolution that outweighs all others. Start each day at the Father's feet. Ask him to anchor your identity as his child. Tell him you trust him, or at least that you want to trust him. And then listen to him, just like Jesus did. Who are you? You're God the Father's child. Sit at his feet. Just be. Just be. <coughs> and the doing will come. You'll be ready for anything in 2024. Let's pray together. Father God, we do thank you for this brand new year, for the exhilaration of uh, new opportunities and uh, new potential, and all that it holds. There are no doubt challenges to be faced too, we know that. And we are so grateful as your people that we can find our true identity in being just your children. And we're grateful too that you're changing us little by little, into the people that you want us to be. And we've got a long way to go, we know that, Lord. So thanks for being patient with us, and thank you for doing the work from the inside to shape us, to put the same power that raised Jesus from the dead into our lives. I want to thank you for being here today, and I pray that we might be open to your activity wherever we are on our spiritual journey, May we be able to live with the freedom of knowing that we're ready for 2024 because we are truly your children. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs>
to do things that are outside your will. And we pray that you'll keep us on the path that you want us to be on. Father, really help us and protect us, we pray. Lord, we live in dangerous times, Lord. There are so many things that can push us off course. So, Father, we just commit ourselves to you this morning. I would like to use some words of fit for as a benediction. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.